Welcome this morning on October the 4th for worship at First Presbyterian Church Bryan or with First Presbyterian Church Bryan or we might even say as First Presbyterian Church Bryan. We're gathered for worship and this is the first Sunday morning that we actually will be in the sanctuary for worship, uh, physically distanced and wearing masks uh, in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, uh, we also will be live streaming that service and uh, Emily will be telling you how you might be able to get to the live stream and to participate that way uh, if you would desire. The live stream will be happening at 1045 along with our worship as it happens. If you would like to watch that worship service with us, if you are watching this video right now, you can see us here in the picture and just down you'll see a little logo with our sanctuary in it and the words First Presbyterian Church of Brian. If you click directly on those words, it'll take you to our YouTube homepage. Once there, you should see a video in the left hand side of the screen labeled for live stream. Now keep in mind the live stream won't start until exactly 10:45 a.m. So if you do look before then, unfortunately it won't be there. It's okay if you're running a little bit late or even days late. That video will still be up after it airs, and we hope that you can enjoy that with us as this service you are watching now does not currently feature music. Our theme today is part of our series of the six great ends of the church or goals of the church, the third being the maintenance of divine worship. Friends, again this morning, we are worshiping God. Friends, welcome to this morning's worship. Let us pray before we hear the word of the Lord. Holy God, please take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. This morning's reading comes to us from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 3, and then verses 6 through 9, followed by 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Listen now for the word of the Lord. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and say to this the people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Think of us in this way, as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we explore the third of the great ends of the church, originating, uh, as we've said, from a statement of the United Presbyterian Church of North America in 1910. The third great end is the maintenance of divine worship. The maintenance of divine worship means that any group of God's people schedule and plan and arrange for the implementation of worship. That would be music, prayers, songs, scripture, proclamation or preaching, and the periodic celebration of sacraments or ordinances such as the Lord's Supper and baptism. There's no single acceptable location for divine worship. You can think of your own experience as I do of mine, and in my own life experience, I've known of worship, of preaching, of baptism, and of the Lord's Supper in cathedrals, in small country church buildings, in outdoor amphitheaters, uh, 
beside lakesides or riversides, uh, even in a rural setting with the neighbor's hound dog uh, nuzzling open the not quite shut front door and coming to lie down in front of the pulpit while blue dirt daubers buzzed around the fluorescent light in the ceiling. And then there are those sites where, like with the outdoor amphitheater theater, or the riverside or the lakeside where the buzzards or the eagles circle overhead. It's also accurate to say that congregations can become known or trademarked for certain styles of worship, and that's understandable. And you also know where there's a, a contrast such that things don't really fit together. For instance, at the Cathedral uh, of St. John the Divine or at uh, St. Patrick's in Manhattan, you won't find a pastor dressed in business casual and a flannel shirt and jeans preaching. Or at the uh, descending dove independent church of the Holy Spirit you won't find a pastor in a clerical collar and an alb uh, reading from the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer but if we understand that different styles of worship do exist in different traditions and settings why is the maintenance of divine worship one of the six goals or ends of the church. It's because worship is the event through which God communes with God's people collectively or corporately gathered. What we've learned during COVID-19 as First Presbyterian Brian, um, which many churches also have learned in ways similar and different, is that we can be gathered collectively and corporately yet not be at the same site simultaneously. We worship as a people who are gathered in the unity of God's Spirit in Christ, but we may be miles apart or worshiping at different hours of the day. When then God communes with us through worship. God receives people. God engages people. God nourishes people and God commissions people. So we are received and engaged and nourished and commissioned. Received, that is, as children, youth, and adults are invited and gathered around Jesus and engaged for growing spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and relationally. And thirdly, nourished with grace for increased strength and health for the journey through life. And fourthly, commissioned for service following God's call, God's guidance, and God's embodied love in and through Jesus. Received, engaged, nourished, commissioned. That's why and what happens when we worship regularly. And people, people are a huge part of the equation. It certainly is the case that not every worship service for every person is equally inspiring and life-changing. Some say, ah, that's not my style, or I didn't get much out of worship, or I feel bored when I'm there, or I feel unconnected to people or to God in that particular setting. I don't argue with anyone's personally held perspectives. I do understand that the maintenance of divine worship is a primary goal of any church or faith community. I haven't seen the maintenance of divine worship work as such uh, 
in a way that I would completely understand it with every person. Um, I have seen it at work. I've seen worship for all of my years, but I don't claim totally to understand it. That is how it works. The Isaiah scripture, which Emily shared uh, in reading this morning, indicates that there is a richness of symbolism conveying the experience of God who becomes present in the worship setting. And then the verses that are read from 1 Corinthians chapter 4 mention God's people being stewards of the mysteries of God. When I was an associate pastor in San Antonio for four years from 1979 to 1983, my staff supervisor was the Reverend Tom Schmidt. And, and Tom introduced me to his fascination of many years with Paul's reference to being stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, interpreters of Scripture have at least three definitions or meanings that they deduce from that phrase. Uh, the first would be, it may mean those who are students of Scripture and theology who, who are recognized uh, and, and maybe ordained in their particular uh, traditions for the faith insights that they have. They would be the stewards of the mysteries of God, that is, of, of faith and knowledge in faith. Secondly, it, it may mean the priests and pastors who administer the sacraments of the church. The sacraments, with that understanding, would be the mysteries, and the clergy are the certified stewards of the sacraments. Or thirdly, and, and this was my colleague Tom Schmid's understanding, that, that there is a notion of the mysteries of the stewards, uh, the mysteries of, uh, shoot, <laughs> the, that they are stewards of the mysteries of God. That's what Tom would say, and it's what Scripture says, because the whole body of God's people are those who are received by God's grace and engaged by God's grace and nourished through God's grace and then are commissioned by God's grace. God's grace is that mystery and you are the stewards of that grace. And I am. We are, if you take the first letters of stewards of the mysteries of God, we are sotmogs, S-O-T-M-O-G, stewards of the mysteries of God. And our worship together, if nothing else, embodies God's love in different ways, but with the message and with a relational style or styles which convey that grace is alive in all parts of life. Most often, unpredictably. You never know what grace God is going to grow through our worship together. And people are a huge part of that equation. Around 1981, a woman in her late 30s or early 40s came to worship at the San Pedro Presbyterian Church in San Antonio where I served with Tom. She was accompanied that morning by her son who was about 10 or 11. She was not married. Her son was adopted. She was a commercial property manager by occupation. She came looking for a community of faith who would embody God's grace with her and her son, even though, and, and she was very clear-eyed about this, she understood that given who she was and where she was in life, that some communities of faith, including the San Pedro Presbyterian Church, might not accept her for their stereotypes. Stereotypes that maybe they held dear in some ways. Well, in 1983, Joni and I moved to the East Texas town of Henderson about six hours away. 
So at some weekend, uh, after we'd been there a little while, Charlotte and Travis came up to visit with us. And she told me on that visit what she had known for a while, that she was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease with vascular complications, and that she probably would die at some point uh, of a ruptured aneurysm. And that some point could even be in the middle years of her life. That congregation in San Antonio, who in their church power structure, was often not sure what to make of Charlotte because they, like we all do, tend to live by their stereotypes. Here in 1983, you have a single woman with an adopted child. She's a professional, etc. Well, they eventually elected her chairwoman of the building committee for a new sanctuary because she knew about buildings and they understood that. A year later, and a few months maybe, when the construction phase was just underway, Tom called me to say that Charlotte had suffered a leaking brain aneurysm and within days she died. Travis moved to live with Charlotte's parents and Charlotte's body was cremated. Her parents hesitantly asked if the cremains could be scattered among the rebar before the concrete was poured to the sanctuary's foundation. That's what was done as my former colleague Tom calculated Charlotte's uh, to the best of his ability, her approximate sitting location in the new sanctuary, which would be um, three pews from the front uh, on the right side in the center as people sit. And at that point, among the rebar, her cremains were poured the night before the concrete was poured for the foundation. That congregation, don't you see, figured out how relationships can grow even beyond stereotypes, their stereotypes. They figured out before it was too late, thanks be to God, how remarkable a person Charlotte was and how she was in fact a remarkable steward of the mysteries of God. And in that equation, how her being a Satmog made them stronger as stewards of the mysteries of God than they otherwise would have predicted. Sadly, and with humorous irony, of course, Charlotte took her place in the new sanctuary before any of them. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory, claiming us in love and influencing us by grace as all sorts of people to be stewards of the mysteries of God. That's why the church is responsible for the maintenance of divine worship where God receives and engages and nourishes and commissions all ages and types of people. If we don't maintain that tradition, habit, and custom in various ways, however worship might change somewhat through the years, friends, we will be the losers. Yet if, like that church in San Antonio, 35 plus years ago and so many others all around the world and through the centuries if we maintain the worship of God and the relationships that God graciously even surprisingly grows among us with other persons we will also be changed as God sees fit as God challenges us and as God moves among us with life-changing and community-changing love in the way and spirit of Jesus. Yes, we stewards of the mysteries of God will always be being changed as the eternal Holy One 
intends. All honor and praise be to God. Friends, let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, receive our thanksgiving for all that you have given to us and of which you have called us to be stewards. Multiply the offerings of our lives with a witness to your love through faith communities and among your people, both close by and around the globe. God of mercy, as your love and power both mend brokenness and give support in the most threatening of situations and to the most vulnerable of persons. Where relationships are torn by cutting remarks and stubborn pride, bring your healing. Where the distance of miles creates loneliness, bring your healing. Where war, anarchy, political and religious strife either smolder or ignite and spread rampantly, bring your healing. Where illness and injury and age have taken their toll, bring your healing. Spare us, O God, not the ambiguities and pain in life. Grant not success as we measure success. Yet go before us, beside us, and behind us, abiding close, that we and all others might receive your life in abundance and behold your realm in providence, even amid this world's difficulties. Now, Lord, we come to you praying also the things that Jesus taught the community of faith to believe and give voice to. We pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we go out into the world today, let us go out in community with one another, bearing with one another, abiding with one another, so that we may truly know worship together, so that we may glorify God in all the ways that we are together. And may we do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.